The next example will show you the combination of the Radwin 2000, for example, and the HBS where you have the service providers knock, you have the Radwin 2000 backhaul, or any other backhaul that you find acceptable for that bandwidth. Radwin is not demanding that you have to use that with their HBS. It's not required. However, they do like the fact that you can synchronize those two with hopsite synchronization. So if you have more than one sector, if you have stack sectors, and you're using Radwin 2000, everything will play nicely. Another slide here that shows a very interesting feature, which is called the self-backhaul. As you can see here, there is no dedicated backhaul in this case. And what HPMP 5000 allows you to do is, you see that little white and, and red building up at the top that says service provider premises? Well, you can actually install a 50 megabit subscriber module on that building. And for example, install 20 megabit or 10 megabit subscriber modules on the remote ends where you need the bandwidth. Well, the base station will actually take bandwidth coming from the 50 megabit subscriber that resides in the service provider premises and redistribute that through the base station to the end clients, effectively eliminating the need of a dedicated backhaul. The only prerequisite for this is that the uh, serving SUs are all in the same sector. That means that both the self-backhaul SU and the SUs that are being delivered the bandwidth reside in the same sector. Another interesting way to deploy is where you have a single base station serving two sectors. You can take single polarized or unipolarized antennas and connect that to each of the ports of the base station. In the CMO mode, you can have two sectors. You can have 16 subscribers combined in both sectors in any ratio. You can have up to 25 megabits capacity per sector. This is good if you don't have to deal with near line of sight or non line of sight conditions. Also, if you don't have capacity issues, you don't have a lot of capacity requirements, perfect for smaller deployments. Hey, Vlad, you have a couple of questions in your chat box. Yes, I'm going to go to that. The Radwin Sync. OK, let me explain that. The Hopside Synchronization Kit allows you to do one of the two things. The first option that you have to synchronize these radios is if you set one of the radios to be a sync generating master. Then through the hub side synchronization kit, all other radios set to slave will actually receive this clock generated by the master and sync up to it, allowing all the transmitters and all the receivers to be set to the same exact TX and RX sequence. So they are not talking when someone else is listening or vice versa and creating self-interference. Very, very similar to, to what you've seen with other vendors, but very useful in this case, especially when you're having multiple sectors on one tower and or using the Radwin 2000 backhaul. So, um, Vlad, could that, could that accommodate uh, synchronization between POPs, between tower sites? Well, effectively, if you're using the internal clock, then no, because the internal clock is always going to differ on different sites. With GPS clock, then yes, because effectively all the tower sites will get the same clock from the GPS satellite. That makes sense? Absolutely. Thanks. All right. So we're looking at the last example for the rural broadband connectivity. For example, you have multiple villages. And this is where I was saying about using some other technology for the last mile. You can have one big tower, in this case designated as BS. You put the base station up or three different sectors, for example, if you need 360 coverage. And you can actually deliver this bandwidth to this village or that village or ranch or maybe a small community. And on those properties or at those villages, you can have a smaller tower that picks up that signal and redistributes that signal using Wi-Fi or mesh or any other technology or even point to point to some other clients for that last mile segment. The sector capacity, in this case, shown uh, at 30 kilometers, which is substantial, 30 megabytes per second, and you're feeding six villages at five megabit per second. As I said, bear in mind, this is not the ultimate capacity. It's just an example of how you sum up different kinds of, of bandwidth that you're delivering, but you're still limited with range, so I wouldn't expect 200 megabit aggregate at 40 kilometers. 
So video surveillance. As you all know, video surveillance very critical as far as latency, very critical as far as the bandwidth. And this is where the system natively slips in where others can't and where they're struggling. Even though the specs on other TDD systems might say, yes, we're able to deploy 150 megabit per second using 802.11n. However, when you put them in the uh, video surveillance application, they really cannot cope with that kind of traffic and latency. So the latency source, also the number of cameras, the number of sites with cameras that can be supported is significantly lower than if you would use this with the same product for, for say, data applications. This is a perfect product for that because we all know at short range you don't really necessarily have those issues. However, once you try to cover several miles, those issues arise, and that's where the Radwin HPMP 5000 steps in. You can actually connect those cameras with a high-capacity subscriber. As I said, 50 megabit highest, 20 uh, middle, and 10 lowest, and then transfer up to 16 camera sites or 16 camera cluster sites to the base station, and then use the high-capacity backhaul 200 megabit Radwin 2000C to transfer that back to the NOC or the service provider if you're on a remote site to be viewed remotely. So I'll just uh, stop here for a second and see if anyone has any questions. Does anyone have any questions regarding the, the vertical markets, um, applications, or anything regarding the system? Uh, this is Steve Williams. During the presentation, uh, a couple of people brought up 3650 and 2.5 point to multi-point. Uh, I sent that email off to Israel during the middle of the conversation. Answer back. Point to point 2.5. Is the only thing available in 2011. No 2.5 point to multipoint is planned. However, 3650 multipoint is planned for August 2011. I think that was Eric that would have been interested in that. Good to know. So I have some technical specs also if someone's interested. I'm going to put that up on the screen while I'm waiting for any potential questions. Uh, let me show the... Um, the base station specs first. So as you can see, form factor, very, very similar to the RW2000 connectorized. Last page here. A little bit more technical. It's not a technical webinar, but we have some specs here, so why not share? So as you can see, 100 megabit net aggregate at 20 megahertz panel width, 200 at 40 megahertz coming in August, up to 16 subscriber modules per sector, up to 40 kilometers, 25 miles of range. Channel bandwidth is going to be configurable with the next release because right now it's only 20 megahertz. It's using uh, OFDM modulation and 2x2 two two MIMO. You can see the levels of modulation or the types of modulation used, uh, BPSK, QPSK, 16 QAM, and 64 QAM. Adaptive modulation coding is supported. Bandwidth allocation currently is symmetrical, 50-50. With the August release, it's going to be asymmetric. So if you need that for video surveillance, if you need to allocate more bandwidth in upload direction or vice versa, you can do that. DFS fully supported for the 5.4. End-to-end -end latency, 3 milliseconds can be achieved, typical 4 to 10. You can see the ratio here, 4 milliseconds at 4 SUs and 10 milliseconds at 16 SUs per sector. Diversity will be supported in the August release. Spectrum viewer as well, so the base station will have a spectrum analyzer built in. Maximum TX power 25 dBm. We all know it's DDD. It does have and support forward error correction and AES 128 bit encryption. The interface is a gigabit interface. The software currently is 100 base T with the upgrade to 200 megabit and the 40 megahertz wide channel. The chip will be unlocked to a full thousand base T. Something else that might be important, QoS, four Qs per subscriber, VLANs, and also Q and Q. GPS synchronization, as I said, through the HubSite synchronization kit. Someone might be interested in power consumption, 25 watts. If you're planning solar deployment, operating temperatures, you can see carrier grade and IP67 compliant. So that's pretty much it as far as the technical aspects. So with that, I would like to turn this over to uh, my team, Steve or Lisa, if you want to 
say a couple of words about the event again. I'm going to pull that up on the screen. Fantastic. Okay, well, if nobody else has any questions, we'd really appreciate the time that you set aside today. We know your time is valuable. Uh, we'll be doing a follow-up to see if you want to attend the 21st and get some pricing out to you. If you have any questions, you can send them to sales at wirelessguys.com or L for Lisa Mia at wirelessguys.com. And uh, thank you again, one and all, for, for attending today.